We'll now cover longitudinal maneuvering stability. The information for this section can be found in chapters 24 and 25. In order to perform their missions, airplanes must maneuver. They just can't fly straight and level forever. The level of positive maneuvering stability, however, depends on the airplane's mission. We would expect a large transport aircraft to have high levels of positive maneuvering stability, yet a fighter aircraft that has to be nimble and maneuver quite often would have lower maneuvering stability. Both the military specifications and the FAA regulations contain requirements for maneuvering stability. So let's look at flight at other than 1G. If our wings are level, to the horizon, then we can do a loop, we can pull up, we can push over, or we can do a combination of pull up and push over, which is called a roller coaster. These are purely longitudinal maneuvers. The wings are level the entire time. But we can also get elevated G by doing level turns. And we see that the load factor, NZ or N, in a level turn, is one over the cosine of the bank angle. We can also derive equations for the turn radius to be true airspeed squared over g divided by the square root of n squared minus one, or the turn rate, capital omega, is our speed v over the turn radius. The plot on the lower right shows normal load factor as a function of bank angle to sustain a level turn. We have equations for pitch rates depending on whether it's a wings level steady pull up or a steady level turn with a bank angle. The pitch rate theta dot for a pull up is g over the true airspeed times the load factor n minus one. For a level turn, it's g over the true airspeed times n minus one over n. And load factor on the diagram on the right shows that structure is important. We don't want to have structural damage and so we typically want to keep the load factor inside the green area and then maybe extend slightly more in the caution area but we definitely want to stay out of structural damage or structural failure. For longitudinal maneuvering you typically pull back on the stick and you expect the normal load factor will increase but you want a reasonable level of sensitivity as you pull on the stick. One pound of stick force shouldn't get you right away to nine G's. On the other hand, to get to two G's, you shouldn't have to pull a hundred pounds. We also want the slope of stick force per G to be somewhat linear. And we can map stick force per G to elevator per G, typically with a gearing ratio constant G. So as we start to have pitch rate on the aircraft, it changes the relative wind that's seen by the horizontal tail compared to the angle of attack on the main wing. This change in alpha contributes significantly to the stability of the aircraft in maneuvering flight. In the diagram, you'll see position one is the relative wind at the horizontal tail prior to maneuvering and original tail download. Position two, we see the relative wind at the horizontal tail change during the maneuvering causing a reduced tail download. Since pitch rate is a function of NZ, NZ is used as the independent variable when evaluating maneuvering stability. The elevator position required to maintain a given airspeed in maneuvering flight is going to be greater than that for the same airspeed in level flight. This difference in elevator position can be translated into a pitching moment due to pitch rate. And so we have equations for m theta dot, or mq, as we've used before. We can also take those coefficients and put them in a non-dimensional form, cm theta dot, or cmq. And you can see they're a function of the lift curve slope of the tail, the moment arm between the tail aerodynamic center and the main wing aerodynamic center, 
and other parameters like dynamic pressure and the tail area. Let's now examine the equation for elevator position for a steady wings level pull up at a constant airspeed. We see that the elevator position at the pull up is the elevator position for when CL equals zero or delta sub E sub zero minus some numbers, but the, in brackets you'll see two terms. The first term is our static margin or our longitudinal static stability term DCM DCL and it's the stick fixed margin. It's also multiplied by the load factor n. The second term in the brackets, we see cm theta dot, so it's a, it's a damping term. It's multiplied by n minus one and some other stuff. If we differentiate this equation with respect to load factor n, we get the second equation. We see that the change in elevator position as a function of change in load factor for a, a pull up is the equation shown. Again, has some stuff outside the brackets, and inside the brackets is our DCM, DCL fixed, so our longitudinal static stability stick fixed margin, and the damping term. D delta E dN is negative because more up elevator is required to stabilize the aircraft at load factors above n equals one. And again, we see that the first term in the brackets of the equation is stick fixed stability term, and the second is a pitch damping term. Now let's look at the equations when we roll into a bank and do a steady turn. Really the only difference between the equations on the previous slide and this is what multiplies that second damping term inside the brackets. We also see that aft movement of the CG affects both the stick fixed stability term and the damping term. The damping term changes because the tail arm becomes smaller as the CG moves aft. The way to sometimes visualize this is think of a fly swatter. If you have a long arm on the fly swatter, moving this fly swatter up and down does the air dampens pretty good. If you shorten that arm on the fly swatter, you get less damping. When the CG reaches the stick fixed neutral point, then D delta E dN only depends upon the damping term. If we continue to move the CG aft of the stick fixed neutral point, eventually that damping term will also become zero and the overall slope D delta E dN will also be zero. This CG location is called the stick fixed maneuver point N sub m. Again, let's look at the main wing and the mean aerodynamic cord and see that the CG can travel, typically travels from 10% mean aerodynamic cord to 40% mean aerodynamic cord. We see our stick fixed neutral point and our static margin are defined as before, but now we have two new points. And we'll get multiple maneuver points because they vary with NZ. But we'll see that as we increase NZ, our maneuver margin will shrink or be reduced. Let's now examine the effects of CG movement on that slope, D delta E dN. We see that as we move the CG aft, that slope reduces and eventually we'll get to a point where the slope is zero. Now let's examine the effects of altitude on our slope at a constant equivalent airspeed. The DCM DCL term doesn't really depend on altitude, so it doesn't change. But our damping term is affected by density and thus decreases with increasing altitude. Now we'll examine the effects of altitude on our slope, but at a constant Mach number. We see the reverse effect. There's a large increase in the DCM DCL term which dominates the change in the damping term. Thus, our slope increases with altitude at a constant Mach number. And finally, we'll see the effects of varying equivalent airspeed on the slope. At higher equivalent airspeeds, the slope is reduced.
In the example here, we see VE2 is twice VE1. So the slope of 2 is one-fourth the slope of the first one. Up to this point, we've been focusing on the change of elevator position with change in load factor. Now let's look at the change in stick force with change in load factor. It turns out that stick force per G may well be the most important single stability and control parameter in flight test, especially for aircraft like fighter aircraft or agricultural aircraft that need a lot of, lots of maneuverability. Stick force maneuvering stability for reversible and irreversible control systems must be considered. For the reversible control system, Freeing the elevator will cause some float angle due to elevator hinge moments. The stick force required to hold some level of normal acceleration will also be affected by this float angle. That's not the case for an irreversible system where there's mechanisms to prevent movement. We have the elevator stays in a rigid position. Mechanisms, though, sometimes introduce an artificial float in the design of the system so that it feels similar to a reversible control system to the pilot. Here's the equations for stick force during wings level pull up or a level turn at constant airspeed. And we see upon inspection that they're really, really close. The only difference is what multiplies the second term or the damping term. In the case of steady pull up, we have N minus one in the case of a steady turn, we have n minus 1 over n. And again, k is a control system gearing constant. Tau is the rate of change of effective angle of attack with change of elevator position. To determine the stick force maneuvering stability, the last two equations are differentiated with respect to normal acceleration. And once again, we see the only difference between the pull-up case and the steady turn case is what multiplies that pitch damping term, the second term in both equations. There's no load factor in the pull-up, but there's a one plus one over n squared in the steady turn. CG location will affect the stick force maneuvering stability in much the same way it affects the elevator position case. The stick free maneuver point is aft of the stick free neutral point, but in most cases ahead of the stick fixed maneuver point. Let's examine the effects of altitude. If altitude is increased at constant CG, the stick force per G decreases with both constant equivalent airspeed and constant Mach number. For constant Mach number, this is the opposite of what we saw with the elevator position per G. If equivalent airspeed is varied from trim, the stick force in maneuvering flight will vary due to the VE squared term in the stick free stability portion of the equations. The stick force per G will not vary, however, due to the fact that the VE squared term drops out of those equations. So this presents a problem in measuring stick force per G if we don't keep our airspeed constant during the maneuver while we take measurement data. For irreversible control systems, we have similarities to what we saw in reversible control systems. The same relations of control force exist between steady turns and pull-ups. That is, you need more force is required when you're doing a steady turn. Stick force per G decreases as the CG moves aft and poor speed control during the maneuver can result in erroneous data. Let's examine the stick force maneuvering stability equations for an irreversible control system. Our stick force is gonna have some constant K1 that multiplies the elevator deflection delta E. With that, the stick force per G equation becomes what's shown here for a steady turn. Note that the stick force per G is dependent upon the stick fixed stability rather than the stick free stability. For irreversible control systems, we sometimes have 
The stick force is a function of elevator deflection, but sometimes we also add dynamic pressure, and we'll have a different constant, K2. These are called Q-feel systems. And in that case, we have this, the equation shown on the slide. For this system, the influence of trim air speed on stick force per G is the same as for the reversible control system. Finally, we'll look at compressibility effects. When an aircraft enters the regime of compressibility or high Mach number, the wing aerodynamic center shifts aft, causing a large increase in static longitudinal stability. But shock waves may form on the horizontal tail and limit the control effectiveness. Both 1 and 2 tend to increase maneuvering stability. Let's now look at what the FAR regulations say. In the previous FAR, paragraph 23.155, Elevator Control Force Maneuvers, we see that the elevator control force needed to achieve the positive limit maneuvering load factor may not be less than, and then we have differences between wheel controllers and stick controllers. If it's a wheel controller, it's W over 100, where W is the maximum weight, or 20 pounds, whichever is greater, except that it need not be greater than 50 pounds. If it's a stick controller, it's W over 140 for 15 pounds, whichever is greater, except that it not need be greater than 35 pounds. The requirement of paragraph A of this section must be met at 75% of max continuous power for reciprocating engines or the maximum continuous power for turbine engines and with the wing flaps and landing gear retracted. Paragraph C, there must be no excessive decrease in the gradient of the curve of stick force versus maneuvering load factor with increasing load factor. Next, we'll look at military guidance. Boundaries on traditional acceptable pitch axis control forces are specified with that curve. So we see the y-axis st is stick force, the x-axis is NZ, and so we see that the slope, stick force per G, has to be between those bounds. There's a maximum bound and a minimum bound. Pushovers and pull-ups must be stable. No objectional nonlinearities over specified range, and local force gradients shall be as specified. The military also gives guidance on breakout force. Pitch axis control breakout force, including friction, preload, etc., shall be within the following limits. And we look on the, the table and we see for class one aircraft, like general aviation aircraft, we have differences between a center stick and a wheel and a side stick, but there's a minimum breakout force of a half and a maximum of three, four, or one. It's important that we bring the pilot opinion into our overall eva evaluation of maneuvering stability. So we need to consider items of free play, friction, breakout force, and stick force per G. And let's review what the, each of these mean. We see that free play is that the stick can kind of bounce between two positions with minimal force or zero force. There's some wiggle in the stick. And this makes precise tracking at low NZ difficult causes the pilot to slightly fly out of trim to stay on one side or the other of the free play or the dead band. Friction, undesirable, makes poor control feel during maneuvering and, and may mask actual stick force per G at low NZ. We saw breakout force on the previous slide, what the mill standard talked about with a minimum breakout force and a maximum breakout force. So we need to be reasonable. Again, somewhere between a half and one, two, or three, or four pounds. But excessive amount can cause a pilot to feel a lag in the control system and cause him or her to over control. And then finally, stick force per G. For aircraft with missions requiring ex extensive maneuvering, fighter aircraft, agricultural aircraft, etc., the stick force per G should not be so high as to tire the pilot. However, it should be high enough to prevent inadvertent overstressing or over Ging of the aircraft. For aircraft designed with low load factor, large stick force per G is actually good. And for aircraft with side stick controllers, we need a little lower stick force per G because of the human ability to apply force with a side stick controller. 
So we've talked about stick force per G or elevator per G. Now let's talk about what we're going to do in flight tests to get the data. We're going to use three different methods. The first is the steady pull up. Step one will trim the aircraft at a test altitude and a test airspeed. Step two then, without changing trim or power, will zoom climb the aircraft. And then we'll push over to a shallow dive approaching our trim altitude. When the airspeed approaches our trim airspeed, we're going to pull to a pitch rate that's going to achieve the desired NZ, which could be 1.5 or 2 or 3, whatever the requirement is. We want our data to meet the following tolerances, plus or minus 5 knots of our trim airspeed, plus or minus 200 feet of the trim altitude, and plus or minus 15 degrees of the trim pitch attitude. So again, everything up to the, the read data is all just set up. And then we need to read data inside those tolerances. The next maneuver we'll use to get stick force per G is our steady pushover. And the pushover is designed to get data below 1G. Maybe not negative, but somewhere between 0Gs and 1Gs. Step one will trim the aircraft at a test altitude and test airspeed. Then we'll gently push over to a shallow dive without changing the trim or power setting. And as the aircraft accelerates, eventually apply a smooth pull to transition to a climb. When the airspeed approaches trim airspeed, push over to a pitch rate that will achieve the desired NZ. Again, this NZ will be less than one. So something like 0 0.5, 0 0.25, or zero. We have the same tolerances that when we read the data we want to be within plus or minus five knots of the trim air speed, plus or minus 200 feet of the trim altitude, and plus or minus 15 degrees of the trim uh, pitch attitude. And again, everything up to the point where we read data is all just set up. So it looks similar to a pull up, only this time the setup is designed to get the data at the pushover. The third method we'll use to get stick force per G is called the wind up turn. We'll trim the aircraft at the test altitude and test speed and record our trim data. Then we'll add some power, climb 500 to 1000 feet above the trim altitude, and then reset the trim power and then obtain our trim airspeed. Smoothly and slowly roll into the wind up turn while maintaining speed and increasing NZ. So the nose is going to drop and the bank angle will build throughout the maneuver. Wind-up turns are designed to have continuous data recorded throughout the maneuver, so a data acquisition system is preferred when doing wind-up turns. And continue to record data until you hit your maximum NZ. At that point, unload, roll wings level, and smoothly, smoothly pull to a level flight attitude. So with steady pull-ups or steady pushovers or wind-up turns, we're going to basically have data of elevator position and stick force per NZ. When we have that data, we'll plot it for the various NZs we took data at, and we'll fare a smooth curve through the data. We'll want to calculate slopes, D delta E, DNZ, and D stick force, DNZ at some evenly spaced values of NZ. For this example, 1.25, 1.5, 1.75, and 2Gs are the evenly spaced NZ values. And you can see that we'll have the red slopes are for forward CG and the green slopes are for aft CG. On the right, once we get those slopes, we're going to want to plot them versus CG. And we'll fare curves for each NZ. Now we have data for two CGs and we can now extrapolate to the x-axis. Where the curves meet the x-axis is the stick fix maneuver points. And again, we'll have multiple maneuver points for the various values of NZ. And you can see the top plot is our stick fix maneuver points because we're looking at elevator data and the bottom plot is our stick-free maneuver points because we're looking at stick force data. 